start with Village in Brentwood Bay. I'm honored to be here tonight and to ask, be asked to welcome you here to the Coast Salish Territories, a place where we're doing this work tonight, where we have one of the finest Canadians um, of the last generation who has held our government to account. And, you know, um, I've heard Elizabeth talk a lot about Mr. Page, and I'm very excited to hear what he has to say tonight. And I also would like to thank the Green Party of Canada and the Saanich Gulf Islands uh, constituency or electoral area for taking uh, the, the opportunity to acknowledge the territory that we're working in. I am the uh, Green Party of BC candidate out that way, and I think it is important that we do take a few moments to just acknowledge the place that we're working, the things that we're doing, the history that has gone before us, and the future that we have ahead. Heichka, thank you, and I look forward to, uh, to hearing Mr. Page. Heichka. Elizabeth Ney, our MP, to come and introduce Kevin. Party at the federal level, first ever MNP speaker series. It's not a partisan event, but it certainly would be wrong if I didn't pause to identify those candidates who are in the audience running for our cousin, Green Party of British Columbia. Uh, and that would, I'm going to start with Spencer Malthouse, who's running in Victoria Swan Lake. And next to him, Spencer Uh, you just heard from Adam Olson. Adam is the candidate in uh, Saanich North and the Islands. And then there's somebody who's brand new on the scene, Dr. Andrew Weaver, uh, running in uh, Oak Bay Gordon Head. I, I'd love to stop and thank every single member of the executive of Saanich Gulf Islands Green Party because you're so extraordinary. And I know that's not part of my program duties tonight, but each of you knows how hard you work and how much I deeply appreciate it. I couldn't do anything without an amazing group of volunteers who both got me elected and keep supporting me to do the work I'm doing. So Lauren and Don and Jack and Terry and Jocelyn, and I'm sure I'm going to miss people if I start thanking people. I'm looking around the room to make sure. I'm very, very grateful for all of the work of all the volunteers from Sandwich Club Islands Great Party. We couldn't do anything without you. And I know Terry got here early, gave up the chance to have dinner with Kevin Page, which is just so, so noble. People are just noble. But anyway, Kevin um, is an extraordinary human being. I've had the great privilege. I got to meet Kevin, I think, very soon after he became parliamentary budget officer, which was uh, in March of 2008. Uh, and before that, he had been a Canadian economist. He'd been one of those people who worked on the number crunching and figuring out the rigor of reports of our fiscal health. He worked in the Treasury Board Secretariat. He worked in Finance Canada. He worked in the Privy Council office. And he could have remained safely in those rather obscure places. When, when, you know, they're important, but they don't often get in the limelight. And really, the limelight isn't a safe place to be these days. Uh, the Parliamentary Budget Office is a great idea. It was Stephen Harper's and the Conservative Party's idea that there should be, just as there is in the United States, a Congressional Budget Office that members of parliament, whether in government or opposition, should have access to the real goods, the numbers, the sense of, our, you know, is the deficit going to be as big as they say, as small as they say, are we being spun, where's the proof, where's the numbers? And this, this office was created. Now, right away, you could start getting a sinking feeling when it was created within the office 
of the Library of Parliament, instead of being what should have been a standalone budget office reporting to Parliament as a whole, as opposed to serving at the pleasure of the Prime Minister. And there were people who ducked taking that job. So right from the get-go, it says something about who Kevin Page is, that he wasn't afraid to take the job, that he wasn't afraid to say, OK, this is an important function, even though it doesn't have the right kind of budget, even though it's been structured in a place where it's not going to have the kind of independence that it should have had, given the promise that was made in the election. Uh, Kevin is a man of extraordinary integrity. He has fulfilled not just his role as parliamentary budget officer, but the previous 27 work years, giving meaning to the words public service, giving all of us a sense of what it means to give your life for the good of your country without thinking of where it gets you personally. But nothing has tested the metal of a man like the last five years that Kevin Page has been our first ever parliamentary budget officer. He served with distinction, courage, moral fiber beyond that of most mere mortals. And I think all of us feel the same way I do about him, which is that he's a genuine article, a real Canadian hero. And we're awfully glad to welcome him to Victoria. talking about. <laughs> um, but it's true, I was your parliamentary budget officer for the last five years. And actually, the last week and a half I've been unemployed, in which I've kind of enjoyed, to be honest. I should probably say that. And my wife is very happy that I'm here in Victoria, because she was getting tired of watching me walk around the house in the morning with my pajamas on, reading books, and while well, she was heading up to work. <laughs> so. Just a huge thank you. And actually, just before I get started, because I, I don't want to forget, if I could just like thank Don and thank Carrie and Jocelyn and Lauren and Brian and Michael and Wendy. I'm staying at Michael and Wendy's place, which is amazing, and Elizabeth. And I mean, I couldn't. I, 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 there's, there's a number of people I can't turn down in Ottawa if they ask me to do something. And obviously, Elizabeth is one of them. So thank you very much. I thought what I could do today is uh, a few things and um, talk a little bit about some reflections, you know, as, you know, what it was like to be the parliamentary budget officer the last five years, but actually step back a little bit and uh, you know, talk about you know, just a few comments about the state of the nation's finances from my perspective, you know, about parliament's institutions, you know, those institutions that, were, that, that are supposed to hold the government to account, which is a noble thing and a little bit about democracy in that context as well. And just a little bit about the PBO experience. It'll give you that, my bird's eye view of this sort of position. So, but I would say I have like two overarching messages and uh, that I feel strongly about. Number one, I feel like we need to return the power of the purse back to the House of Commons. And, yeah. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, and we'll talk a little bit about that. This doesn't mean to say that we don't want the government to govern. We want the government to govern, but we also... I'm wearing a mic. I'm wearing a mic? Okay, move away from the mic. Thank you. Sorry? Oh, okay, yeah, thank you. This is better, yeah. I'm okay. No, I'm fine. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, again, talk a little bit about the state of the nation's finances, talk a little bit about um, our institutions, a little bit about democracy, a couple of overarching messages. Number one, we need to return the power of the purse back to the House of Commons which is a, a, a constitutional principle that we have in our country in Westminster parliamentary systems. And I think number two, we need to have, I mean, find a way to get back to what we call evidence-based type decision making. It doesn't mean to say evidence is always right, but we shouldn't be making decisions just on ideology alone. And 
Yeah, and I think to some degree, for me, the last five years, you know, the, you know, the, 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 some of the more difficult times that we've had in currently budget office, we were coming up to that, where we were providing the only analysis effectively on some of these big decisions, changes to old age security, changes, you know, costing on fighter planes, and the government was providing press releases with no numbers to Canadians and saying, you know, trust us. So again, so those, to me, those are two things: returning the power of the first back to the House of Commons and getting back to evidence-based decision making. And looking around the room, there's lots of students, you know, interversed amongst other people. And I would think, like, other people, <laughs> you know. And I, you know, I just if you were, and I have kids that are in university, and you know, public service is a great place to be. I had 31 amazing years in the public service in Canada, and there's so many good things to do. There's so many interesting issues looking forward. But I think students want to come to Ottawa to make a difference. You may want to make a difference not just for Ottawa, for their families, but for the country, and maybe even for the world. And you know, to do that, you know, to give people an opportunity to think about those big issues and, and to play on that kind of scope, you need to kind of bring analysis to the table. And they should be able to do that. They should be able to publish their work too. Which is one thing I'm very proud about in our, our office. Everything we've ever done is published. And we had to fight for that. So everything is on our website. We had to fight for our website. And but our you know, people that do the work in our office, they put their names on the papers. And they just to, to see that that sense of pride. When you do that, it's just like, you know, getting back in the university and you're putting your, your term papers in, your master's essays, your doctoral thesis, whatever, your names are on it, that's your intellectual property, but you're doing it for a higher good is a special thing. So, a few points in, about, you know, some of these issues in State of the Nation's finance. It's just, again, a high points, and maybe we'll come back and then, if I do this properly, you'll want, you'll be lots of questions. But I think for, for me, like just on the issue of our national finances, you know, how would you kind of characterize it? For the, you know, to be honest, when I look at the books, and I've been doing this for many years, like actually on a national level, when you look at Canada vis-a-vis -vis other countries, we do look good. And you know, in my office, I've had the privilege of having you know interactions with international organizations, even bond rating agencies have started coming to my office over the past little while. And that's the sense that they get: oh, we don't really worry about Canada because when we look at your fiscal balance sheets. You know, both you know, nationally and federally, it's just it's just much better. We're still we're running deficits, which we haven't been, we didn't run through the late '90s and through the most of the 2000s. But that's because we had a recession, and it was a steep recession. And uh, but so they, when we look at the size of these deficits, for the most part, they look manageable to you know to you know relative to this, the amount of income we bring into our economy. And these are deficits in like one and a half percentage points of GDP. And when people like me, bald-headed guys with glasses, and we kind of do try to decode these deficits, how much of these deficits are structural? So how much would these exist, even if the economy was operating at potential? How much is, it, it, is this deficit is cyclical? You know, which is kind of when the economy gets back to potential, the deficit just goes away, so you don't have to worry about that part of it. And for us right now, it's about half and half. And you know, and so when this government, when the conservative government came in, and I'm, and I'm not a partisan person, they inherited a, what we call a structural surplus, and then with some tax cuts, you know, to you know, both on basically right across the board on personal income taxes, on GST, two percentage points, corporate income taxes, and then some lot of spending, they were actually ran a structural deficit. And we were widely criticized back in even 2009. We were saying to Minister Flaherty, "You got a structural deficit here." You know, then you're running a big deficit at the time because of the weak economy, but some of it was structural. He said, no, 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 we're not running any structural deficit. This is godly good. And uh, but sure enough, he didn't, I don't think he even know it. His own finance department put out some numbers inadvertently in the fall of last year. Their finance people were saying, yeah, we got a structural deficit. Um, so again, so you do have to worry about structural deficits from the point of view. You just don't want to run them over and over again, because that's you know, how we got into that problem in Canada in the mid 1990s. We run these deficits in the 80s and the 90s, and the debt built up to high levels, and so we had a, a problem. So you want to keep it manageable, but we don't have a big structural deficit, uh, and so it, it is manageable. When we look at long-term fiscal sustainability in my office, and we started doing this analysis right in the middle of the recession. And so, how much is if we look at, you know, if we look at that our federal structure, we look at revenues and spending, we look at the current suite of programs, how we bring in revenues, like, and then we stress test it. What happens if, as we, over the next two decades, we're going to get a lot older? People like me are going to become unemployed and then retire. Right? Just unemployed. <laughs> yeah. 
and then so you move off, and so you want to know, like, do we have a structure in place federally that can deal with aging demographics, and, you know, the issue of old age security, issue of health care, those sorts of issues. And you know, when we, 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 we did the analysis in 2009, and we kind of just looked at, or 10, we looked at the federal government, then we added the provinces in 2010, then we did this work in 2011, we actually looked at the pension systems. And we worked with actuaries, we worked with some of our international colleagues. Like our view is that at the federal level, after the federal government cut the transfer to the Canada Health Transfer, like we became federally, we, you know, our, just that structure, I'm not saying it's a structure we want forever, but it's sustainable. And we can deal with the aging demographic issue. The provinces had a bit of a, you know, they have a hole, which we call a fiscal gap. We think it's like two percentage points of GDP. And we have like a $1.7 trillion economy right now, so one percentage point is like $17 billion. So that is a gap, right, that we have to close. And, but it's manageable when we look back where we were in the 1990s, even at the provincial level. Not easy manageable, like you have to worry about, you know, you have to be conscious of this issue. But again, back in you know 2009, 10, 11, Minister Clary saying you know Paige, you're you're academic, you're um, you know you're unbelievable, you're unreliable, you're incredible. In fact, my going away party, we, everybody got T-shirts in my office that said you're unbelievable, unreliable, incredible. <laughs> yeah, it was a, and my wife even got one too. So and she's actually been wearing it more than anybody. I think. <laughs> so. And then, you know, with the government of the day, you know, was not putting out this analysis. They waited until basically the Auditor General in the fall of 2012 said, you know, the federal government has to be releasing the studies, these studies on fiscal sustainability to get released in every other country. PBO has been putting out this work. Where's your analysis? They put it out the same day the Auditor General said you needed to do it. They had the exact same numbers as we had. So you know, early on, we were on this issue of old age security. when. Prime Minister went to Davos and he said we need to change age eligibility to 65 to 67 on the old age security program because it's not sustainable. We said, well, actually, you are sustainable. I said, no, 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 you know, you're, it's, you know, it's not sustainable. I said, well, we looked at the program, we looked, funded from general revenues, we did the analysis. It's the same type of analysis done in other countries. It's sustainable. We took a beating, and sure enough, when you saw this report in the fall of 2000. And, uh, and 12, after the release of the Auditor General's report, finance basically said, yeah, it is sustainable. And again, speaking to why you need evidence-based decision-making. So the government makes the decision, there's a press release. There's no analysis you know, behind it, but we make a big decision. But so from, from the point of view of our structural, again, federally we're okay, province is a bit of a hole, we can deal with it. When we look at growth in my office over the next few years, and we were criticized in, the, in right after the 2012 budget. We said, you know, 2012 is going to be a tough year. 2013 is going to be a tough year for Canada. But not just Canada, but other countries. And for Canada, we're saying we're looking at you know debt at the consumer level. There's a lot of debt. You know, we're looking at a housing sector that needs to moderate a little bit. Uh, we're looking at the government in 2012 launched an austerity program, which means they're taking demand out of the economy. We're saying this is going to slow growth down. So we came out with numbers of what, you know, 1.8% 8 and, and, and 1 8, 1 .8 real GDP growth in 2012, 1 1.6 for 2013, and everybody, the Bank of Canada was, you know, well over 2%, and I was criticized at the House Finance Committee for saying, you know, you know you're so different than the average private sector forecast, I'm saying, well, where's the growth going to come from? You know, the United States is, you know, is basically going to have to go to fiscal consolidation, Europe's in a recession. And we see, like, we've seen very slow growth. This does not mean to say anybody can predict the future. You know, Mr. Carney cannot predict the future. Mr. Flaherty cannot predict the future. Kevin Page cannot predict the future. But it does say it's good to have independent analysis. Even if it's different, not everybody has to be the same. And there's nothing perfect about an average private sector forecast. Put it out, throw the debate out, let's, you know, and let's talk about what it actually means. Because it does mean it. You, you have an economy that's operating well below potential, and you start having austerity that there is an impact to that. And, you, know, and the, you know, the government of the, you know, the day basically said, no impact on austerity when the economy is operating below potential. We said, no, there is an impact. It'll cost you, and just using the same analysis the government used for stimulus, just the other side of the coin, and now we're in austerity, we're taking money, it will cost a percentage point of GDP. It will cost 100,000 jobs easily for Canadians. That's using finance analysis, but just you know, looking at us the flip side. Um, so I just think, you know, looking ahead, we know we're going to have, 2013 will be a bit sluggish. Normally in Canada, when we look at, you know, our productivity growth rates or, and growth in labor force, we think two percentage point growth rate would be fine if the economy was operating potential. So we're, most of the private sector now is around one and a half percent. 
And this is the economy that's still below potential. So we're just chugging along. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with it. It's that, again, we had a nasty recession, which was a debt type of recession in, in 2008. It just takes time for all this debt to kind of work through the system. Uh, so we're still growing, but it's slow growth. And that means the deficit comes down a little bit slower. It means unemployment rates stay a bit higher. And it just, it is what it is. And you know, maybe if President Obama would have said that back in 2008 when he got elected, he said, guys, this, this is going to be not easy my first mandate. I think you would have set expectations a little bit better. So it's good to have, I think, those expectations. And again, that's why people do projections. And we have somebody asked Mr. Galbraith, Ken Galbraith, why do economists do projections? He says, they don't want to do it. It's because we need planning frameworks. And so it's because these politicians are political leaders like Mrs. May can make these decisions based on what they think you know, the reality may be. I think the third point about the state of the nation's finances that bothers me is that we're avoiding all the big conversations. You know, you look at the budget, and I had this discussion with Elizabeth over our supper, like 450-page budget, like where's the big issues? You know, you look at the front, I, you know, I, I, when I look at budgets, I look at, the, you know, the, I, just, I look at numbers at the front and then in the back end of the book, and you know, what's the view of the planning framework, where's the health, strong is the economy going to be, which change? Then I look at the measures at the back, nothing changes in this budget. There's some, some significant possible measures around changing labor training programs, there's some infrastructure money that's going to happen you know, years down the road. But effectively, the numbers over the medium term, they don't even move. Like this, to me, it's like there's nothing in this budget. So yeah, when you talk to Canadians, and I've been to multiple universities, the kids, they want to talk about, you know, even they want to talk about, like, what's the health care of the system of the future for this country? They know that aging demographics is happening, it's happening, and they know they're going to have to pay the bill. They want to talk about sustainability. They want to talk about innovation. They want to talk about income disparities that are going to happen as you get, you know, economies getting more and more knowledge based. Where are those issues? They're not being discussed. Or, you know, it's complete willful blindness, I would argue. And um, you know, we're at a transition point. I think in Canada, as we looked at this aging demographic issue over the next couple of decades, and you know, it's you know, sluggish productivity growth. It would be nice to have almost you know, royal commissions, you know, on these sorts of issues. How do we retool our tax systems? What kind of spending frameworks do we need for the future? How much more investment do we need to have? Um, we should be having these discussions. We should have you know, bald-headed people like me with glasses looking at numbers after policy people say, look at this option, look at that option. And we should get universities involved so it's not happening. But again, state of the nation's finances, point number one, not bad. You know, so you know, we're, we're you know, headed to balance over the medium term. Um, it's not a bad place to be. We're not, we didn't pile on a, a, a huge amount of debt. I remember when I was working in the Department of Finance and Privy Council office in the mid-1990s, this came up in conversation. The finance minister in the mid-1990s had to pay 38 cents on every revenue dollar in public debt interest charges. So every dollar he brought in, his credit card and basically, in, just on the interest was 38 cents. So Minister Flaherty comes in and he's got 13 cents on every revenue dollar. Like look at the degrees of freedom. That's a good thing. Because again, you look at the, you know, the younger generation around the room, they're going to have to make investments to compete in this you know, new economy, retooling this new economy. It's a lot easier to make investments when you're paying 13 cents on every revenue dollar for interest, as opposed to 38 or 40 cents. So it's good to keep things close to balance. So just a few points about parliamentary institutions. For me, they're under attack right now. Like I've never seen them before in my, you know, in my you know, 30, 35 years of kind of public service. Uh, they're being completely undermined. And for us, like my last, literally, my last two days in, as the Parliamentary Budget Officer, a little over a week and a half ago, we spent in federal court. We were in federal court asking for a reference opinion. And we went to, we went to federal court after a year-long process at following budget 2012 when the government said, guess what, we could freeze program spending, direct program spending, $115 billion a year. We could freeze it for five years and there's no impact. And guess what, you don't even have to see any plans. Just trust us. And we're saying, no, this is undermining the power of the purse. Like, parliamentarians, Mrs. May, she has to go. We, we want her to go to scrutinize spending. How are we cutting spending at Food Inspection Agency? What are we doing at, you know, at the you know, Human Resources Social Development Department? What are we doing at Fisheries and Oceans? How are you freezing spending and telling everybody we're going to have no, you know, no changes to the service level? Like, what's the plan? And they said, oh, you're exceeding your mandate page. Like, you're, you shouldn't be asking these questions. And I said, well, we were asking them for stimulus. We, you know, and we were actually quite supportive, saying like the economy is quite weak. You've got to put some money in there. You could soften the blow for many Canadians. We had the room, so we should be asking the question on austerity. And then, so we were in federal court the last two days. 
But to me, I could not even think of a more fundamental way to undermine Parliament than to say, we're not giving you any plans. We're giving you nothing to hold us to account. So even one year after Budget 2012, which is literally on the space of about $150, $120 billion worth of spending, they're taking $15 billion out a year. There's still no plan from the Department of National Defense, no plan from Fisheries and Oceans, no plan from any department that tells them how, tells parliamentarians like Mrs. May, how are they going to achieve it? You know, and I mentioned that, I get to go to the Autonomy's International meetings, we chair it, actually I chair the OECD meeting for budget officers, and I tell these people that, they say, you're kidding me, you can't do that? Like, you have no plan? How did you get away with that? But that is what happening, is happening right now. Like, that is, to me, is unbelievable. That is wrong. That is just wrong. So again, in the same spirit, like, you know, and again, sharing some experiences in my office and why we found it a bumpy road, like again, the, the best way to undermine Parliament is don't give them anything. Like don't give them anything, what we call decision support material. So for example, let's not tell people what the cost of Afghanistan is. And for some people, like it's not like we need to know, like, it's not like it's, it needs to be this number or that number, but for people like me, even like bean counters, like we know when you send people to war and you keep them there for 10, 11, 12 years, there's capital, there's people there. And some of those people are gonna come back, we've lost like 150 plus soldiers. And then there's many more they get post-traumatic stress in there. How much money are you setting aside to take care of these boys? And so that's an issue. It's still to be that. So no, we're not telling you that. We never saw, you never got that number from D and D, you never got that from Minister McKay or the Prime Minister. The same thing, okay, how much capital went in? How much how many billions of dollars of capital do we have in Afghanistan? That depreciates. Helicopters, jeeps. What kind of military do you want afterwards before you start buying more expensive fighter planes? Like, so, you know, how much are you setting aside the right amount of money for that stuff? Talk on crime legislation. I mean, we first, I, I know nothing about, you know, the criminal justice system when we, were, we found this question, but it, we found that the, the Minister of Justice and Public Safety said, you know, we're going to basically, we, were, we got involved in 2009 with something called the Truth and Sentencing Act, where they're going to change the remand system. And we're saying, okay, fine. So, okay, you're going to keep people, more people are going to be in the system, they're going to stay longer. What's the cost? Well, there's no cost. <laughs> no cost. I said, you're kidding me, right? There's, no, there's, there's not even one piece of paper that, you know, to explain. And there's nothing even showed up in any budget on the, on the tough and time legislation. They said there's no cost. I said, well, you've got to show me your numbers. Said, no, no, we don't. Have to say. In fact, it's a cabinet confidence. But you, know, you want members of parliament like Mrs. May to vote on this legislation. Shouldn't you give her something? No, we don't have to do that. Well, it's not the way the system is supposed to work. So when we, you know, when we put together some numbers, we actually came up with estimates. A lot of this actually is at the provincial level when you start dealing with the system because of the nature of our criminal justice system. And as I was saying, I think I was saying to Don, or saying to Michael actually on the way over from the airport, we would actually, we'd go to Statistics Canada and say, you know, we're really struggling. How do you estimate this stuff? We go to the provinces. We're asking for data, trying to figure out how the system kind of works, and we're finding like we're the first person people knocking on the door. I guess we you know obviously justice people must have been here. No, they haven't, we haven't seen them yet. I said, well, no, we're changing the criminal code for Canada. Like this, they must have some numbers. Like you know, before you go to cabinet, before the prime minister and finance minister signs off on this stuff, it, the executive has to scrutinize it. So they must have. So no, nobody's. You're the first people here. Actually, we've done the same thing on fighter planes. When, you know, F-35s, we know nothing about fighter planes. You know, I wouldn't know a difference between a fighter plane and a Prius. But so, <laughs> uh, gone, but Prius gets a better mind. <laughs> they do, actually, yeah. So we go to Washington, and we're asking, and go to the program offices, and, you know, we're asking people, like, modeling people, like, how do you model this stuff? Like, who, who, who are the experts? And we're asking people like who testified on this, at, you know, in Washington, et cetera. And you know, then we always ask, well, you know, did, have, has anybody been here? Any Canadians here? No, you're your first guys here. I said, holy smokes, we just had an announcement we're buying 62 of these things. <laughs> and, and this is like we know with billions and billions of dollars, right? And so, yeah, it, it was like an amazing experience. And I could go on the same thing for old age security, same thing for ships in many ways. Like we go around asking people, like we don't know, we haven't built any of these ships. In Canada, in 30 years, we won't, it'd be great to build them here, but okay, how much is it going to cost? 
And then you start going around and say, who does this sort of work? And we, and we went to you know, Denmark, we went to the States, you know, Korea, we're asking them because they do this stuff. You know, they pump out these boats all the time. Again, we are the first ones there. Not a good thing. So how do you, you know, again, how do you undermine parliament? You start with the information. Like in my world, if I'm a public servant, like I think that stuff, like in New Zealand and some other countries, you, you just proactively, public servants, you should just have to release it. Like there's nothing cabinet confidence about this number, adding and subtracting numbers. This, you know, you know, what are the priorities of the day, the political discussions around policy directions, the ideology, that's cabinet confidence. Adding and subtracting numbers, I don't see that as cabinet confidence. I think that the third thing that really bothers me about parliament inst institutions is our appropriation system. So after we have these budgets, which are high-level documents, you know, and you know, and they're very sketchy in the details, like you want to see the details of the departments. And then you want parliamentarians to scrutinize the system. Our system is completely broken. It's not just broken under this government, broken under multiple governments. Parliamentarians don't feel incentive to do this. Like they kind of scrutinize the spending. We get incensed that we don't like, we don't haven't created a system that allows them to change these appropriations. So they say, like, why even bother to start? And then when they look at the books, they can, nobody can follow it. I would say there's like Maybe nobody, even in Ottawa anymore, can actually follow going from the budgets to departmental spending, from one cash system to another cash system, from voting on inputs, you know, and you know, money being managed on program activities. It's just a slot. It's a mess. So, like, it's but it's it, why is it a mess? It, it, it could easily be fixed up. It's not. It's not rocket science. You could easily have a budget and estimates documents totally aligned. It's designed that way because you know bureaucrats and sometimes you know the executive they don't want members of parliament to scrutinize. So we design a system to be dysfunctional. How do I know that? Guilty as charged. You know I worked in that system. You know for different parts of it. Why? And it's so hard to change. That like it will take that will take like a royal commission and then you know maybe Mrs. May becomes prime minister of this country. He says, I'm just going to do this for one mandate, but I'm going to fix it, you know, and we're going to return the power of the purse. We're going to clean up the system. It's not rocket science, and we can even level a playing field. So it's not like, you know, the cabinet ministers have thousands, like 350,000 public servant employees to support them. Mrs. May has, you know, 15 people in the PBO and a few parliamentary researchers and usually one student sort of thing. And so we actually level the playing field so that really the power of the purse you know, so it does the government's govern? They they made they propose, but there is real scrutiny. The last thing I would say on parliamentary institutions is like my office that I've tried to build the past five is being dismantled. There's just no question that it's, you know, it's being unwound. I mean, I'm here today. Like just like I have two amazing weeks of unemployment. They're still having to interview people to replace me. You know, the governor of the Bank of Canada. That process started months ago, and Mr. Carney said he's not going to finish his seven years. And they had a very public process. Every, you know, all the directors of the Bank of Canada are known by name. It's a very transparent process. There's some really good candidates. And that person will definitely be in place well before Mr. Carney leaves. But here at the County Budget Office, we're talking about the power of the first, trying to level the playing field for, for MPs. No effort. And the, you know, the current the interim parliamentary budget officer is the librarian. She's never worked on one budget. Uh, and yet, I, I swear to you, we have an amazing team of people in that office that I put together. They were handpicked, and they were hand, not handpicked like I had to twist their arms. They said, "No, I want to come. If you want to build a real budget office for Canada, I'm in." And those are the people that are there right now. But I think you know, for for, for different reasons, this being unwound. I think in, I said years ago that one mandate would be enough for me because the legislation is wrong. I was appointed by the prime minister. And it's just like, again, think of it. Why would, you know, I'm the watchdog, so to speak. I don't really like that term because I like dogs too much. But I'm, <laughs> I'm the watchdog of the prime minister who manages the finances for the executive, who oversees, who has to be held accountable. I'm appointed by the person I'm supposed to, you know, watch. How does that work, right? So what's happening now? Who do you think is going to be the next parliamentary budget officer? Like, you know, and it, it, it's, it, you can decide. Uh, you know, and I think the experience, I mean, even though when, the, when the, this office was created, the Conservative, you know, the, the Conservative Party was in opposition. So they wanted a, a congressional budget office type independent authority providing numbers, you know, and, and making sure that we had, you know, fiscal transparency, making sure that MPs, members of Parliament had what we call decision support analysis. They wanted that. But again, what's in it for the government when they have power? 
Probably not much. Honestly, there's not much. And, uh, and I, actually, yesterday morning, I got, I got a call from former Prime Minister, Finance Minister, Mr. Martin. Paul Martin phoned me. I was just a, kind of out of the blue. I couldn't believe it. And he said in a really nice way, like he was really impressed with the work that we did at the office. He wanted to help. He's worried about the office. And they, he, he kind of said, you know, I'm not sure I would have liked to have you around in the 1990s. <laughs> I think he would mind me kind of saying that. He said that to me twice over the past five years. But because, again, at that point in time, like if they were really, we had a major debt problem. And we had, even though we had, you know, the U.S. was growing, Europe was growing, we had what economists like to call tailwinds kind of pushing us along, we had no choice. We were like Cyprus. We were like, you know, uh, Greece. We had to bring the debt down. And so he made sure that he was not going to miss it. So these numbers were very conservative in that sense, and he beat all his targets. And uh, so we had, you know, these you know significant surpluses, which we, yeah, I think, you know, the current government has benefited by. So we're in this transition period of time for PBL. Just a few words on like the implication of having weak institutions for democracy. I think you know this word's come up even in you know in the, between here and the airport. Like I think it's not a good thing when ideology trumps. You know, evidence or whatever evidence. Not to say that evidence is always right. You know, particularly when you're looking to the future, it's probably more often than not going to be wrong. But just making decisions just based on the ideology. We talked about crime. And even fighter planes was a bit like that too for us. No, we got to have stealth. Well, what's why do we have to have stealth? Like, why are we going to spend like you know an extra 15 or 20 percent per plane just to have this type of stuff? Do we want strike fighters? Do we want to be the first people in? Is that where is that the future? Let's have that debate in Parliament. And then, you know, let's have PBO, we'll add some private numbers to see what are we paying for, for, for this. So it, it, again, it had that, that sort of sense of feel. And um, like to me, again, like on those, uh, the crime issues, you plant the seeds for the next fiscal crisis. So, the, you know, a finance minister today is saying, you know what, we can be tough on crime and there's no cost. And then the finance minister, or even a provincial finance minister, 10, 15, 20 years down the road saying, well, I'm, my costs are skyrocketing here. I don't have, you know, I'm double bunking, I'm triple bunking, whatever. Are these fighter planes? You told me I was going to get them for 75, I have to pay 135, and they're way more expensive than you thought. Now I have to sacrifice, I have to cut back in the Navy, I have to cut back on the armed forces. So you plant these seeds when you don't actually have the evidence on the table when you're making these decisions. But I think there's, there's a great book, I think, that, you know, that I really enjoyed reading in 2012, Why Nations Fail. And I've talked about this book. It's written by two you know, very well-known economic development people in the United States, Ashton Blue and Robinson. And they said, you know, you know, nations fail to a large degree when the leaders, they want to consolidate power at the expense of citizens. Very powerful statement. Now, I would buy the book. It's a great book. But you know, or if you don't want to buy the book, go to chapters and just read the first chapter. <laughs> And then they, but nations succeed, they said. They succeed when, they, when, when political power is dispersed. So we had big arguments in the past few weeks about the role of backbenchers, who are actually not part of the executive. Why shouldn't they feel like they're you know, asking questions in a few question period, they, you know, that they, they feel that their elected representatives want to know that they're asking? What's, like, what's wrong with that? And so you want political power to be dispersed. Number two, they say, you know, nations succeed when, when legislatures can hold the governments to account. They have to hold the government to account. And then number three, they say, which is a point I really like, it's like I grew up in, and my dad was a machinist, and I had a kind of a stay-at-home mom. I grew up in Thunder Bay, and I got to go to university, and I got to be the county budget officer for five years. Nations succeed when you get economic opportunities to people. You make it a They're one of the three points these guys say when they look at the big you know, arc of history. is that you've got to hold governments to account. And we have totally undermined our system right now. We have no system in place right now to hold the government to account. We have a system where basically the government is saying, on budget 2012, we have austerity, but I'm not showing you the plans. You know, on crime bills, I'm not showing you our work. You know, on F-35s, I'm not showing you our work. On ships, I'm not. You know, where could you go to the bank and say, you know what, I can really use 30 billion right now. You know, and here's my press release. <laughs> That's dangerous when you do that. And there's a great quote. It's an old quote from William Gladstone, a former exchequer, would be like a treasurer and a former prime minister uh, of the UK. In 1891, it says, "If the House of Commons, by any possibility, loses the power of the." 
power of the control of the grants of public money, the power of the purse, depend upon it, your very liberty will be worth very little by comparison. Because when you stretch this out, and again, and I heard this, well, well, it's normal to do this. Like I've heard presidents of the Treasury Board say, we're just following normal practice. There's nothing normal about that. To say, you know what, we're gonna make a big decision, we're taking $20 billion out, and we're not showing you that, that is not normal. And as I've used Bruce Coburn before, I says, the trouble with normal is it always gets worse. That's a great line, right? So there's nothing normal about that. So we got to stop that. And so in a sense, we need to wake up. How is this going to get better? Are we just going to wait for political leaders, to, you know, somebody like Mrs. May, you know, to kind of turn it around for us? Or are people going to stand up? And I, you know, I think the only way people ask me, what do you want me to do? You have, if this is important to you, if you think this is important, you've got to tell your elected representative, you know, it's kind of important. Like when I send you to Ottawa, Wherever you come from, Victoria or St. John's or anywhere, or, or in, I want you to scrutinize spending. I want you to know what's behind changes in tax legislation. I want you, when you come back to Ottawa to my riding, to explain it to me. And if you can't do that, I'm not sending you. You're not the right person for this job. It's as simple as that. You know, and, it's, and I couldn't imagine, like in a 21st century world, with internet and all the analysis, the tools we have that are available, the great university, University of Victoria, et cetera, that you want public servants to produce the analysis and you want to make it available. People talk about science right now. It's another issue playing out in Ottawa, where you know the scientists feel like you can't release the work. And this is incredible. This is just wrong. And so we've got to bring them back. And so some of it is just as simple as you know, us citizens saying to our elected representatives, this has got to mean something to you, it means something to me. So you, that's, if you feel the same way, you've got to do it. Okay, just a bit about the PBO story, and then I'll close. One, I mean, the, the genesis of why a priority budget office? Like, why you know, was I you know, crazy enough to take the job? And in the history, like, for the, you know, for the government, of the, our government, I think the Prime give us a hand with these projections, these planning frameworks. Give us a hand with costing, you know, fighter planes or crime bills. Give us a hand scrutinizing spending. Help us level the playing field. That's as simple, it was as simple as that. Did anybody want the job? Nobody wanted it. Like I was, you know, nice window office looking at the Peace Tower and launch event. People are phoning me, like, would you be interested? No. Uh, why? There's no way. The government doesn't want more accountability. Like this would be almost heresy in Ottawa where the trends were going. And, and so nobody wanted to be in the job. And, you know, why did I take the job? You know, I basically took the job at a certain point where I said, you know what, I've been around the town for a long time. You know, 27 you know, plus years. And I asked a couple of guys, you know, you know, we can maybe do something special here. And if we just, you know, for the country, like build a new institution, like immediately. Like, and the, and the, a couple of my friends, Mustafa, Skir, and Sirikon said, you're doing it. And these guys were amazing. Mustafa ran forecasting and finance as a professor at different universities. I used to mark papers from McQueen like 35 years ago. And see, so here was this guy, Sierra Khan, worked in New York City. Like, he was like already, he's like a wealthy public, he was like, we call him like Kennedy. And you know, it's just, he's made his money, he just, like, he's, for him it's just public service. He'd be ready to go anyway. So if you're going to do it, you know, he said, we have to do it. So these guys came. I said, whoa, if I got these guys, like I've got a shot. And then the other thing happened to me in my life, seven years ago I lost this. A lot, there is no security. This is not. Like you have today, and you have to put everything you got in today. If you could just focus on that, maybe tomorrow's a bit better. And you get through it. So just an opportunity. Like I was perfect for this. Like as I quoted Bob Dylan, I'm out of range. You can't hurt me. Like you can't take anything away from me. So it's just, I was kind of fortunate to be the first cement head from Thunder Bay to be a prime to budget officer. <laughs> learn, and I quote, close on this, I love quotes, I, you know, it's fine, they give me comfort, and there's like, you know, this one historian, Fuller, said, everything is difficult before it is easy, and when you're involved in any kind of change process, Green Party change processes, well, you know, anything, you're building a county budget office, it's always difficult, you know, even, like for me, the mandate, well, this is like a big mandate, and I had, you know, jobs at, you know, in finance and treasury, but I could always pick up the phone and say, you know, the Prime Minister wants this, and he wants it now, now when I phone somebody, they laugh. <laughs> they don't even pick up the phone because they, they, they recognize the number. So like that, that was difficult. You know, so we had to figure out like how do we do this? It's a big mandate for a small amount of budget office. 
But then, then we started bringing the right people, and I said, no, we'll just focus on issues. We'll get, it'll become normal to start a project like fighter planes. I don't know anything about this. Let's go find somebody that does. And then you start that process. That felt, it's difficult, then it gets a little easier. Part of the change process. The second quote I really like that's helped us me out a lot in the, in the last five years is from Einstein. It's the, kind of a bumper sticker. In the middle of difficulty, you will find opportunity. So every time you, somebody like, throws some crap your way, you'll figure, how do I turn this into an opportunity? So like we're sitting in, like in 2008, we get from you know, Mr. Dewar, a good parliamentarian from the Ottawa area, from the NDP party, the Democratic party, can you cost a war? Whoa. Like we're like two people in my office at the time, costing a war. <laughs> but I said, whoa, this could be, if we pull this off, this would be kind of neat, right? <laughs> and then it was the question of like, how do we find the people that actually cost in wars before? And then, then a recession hit. You know, and if recessions are nasty, people lose their jobs big time, and then you go from surpluses to deficits. And so it's very painful. So you're sitting back here saying, whoa, this is an opportunity. Like, all of a sudden, Parliament needs more information. And they need to understand deficits. They need to understand where the economy is going, what's driving the economy, how deep will this recession. Maybe they don't get that from the Minister of Finance. All of a sudden, whoa, I'm starting to see a little opportunity in all this misery. Not that it's good for the country, it's not good for the country, but it's an opportunity to build an office. And then, like, the transparency issues. When we have a first big project, like the Cup on Pine, we're not giving any account and confidence. Whoa! This is an opportunity. And then you follow the correctional service. We're not giving you any information. Perfect. <laughs> this is good. I'll just, you know, if the provinces, they run prisons, you know, and stats can they have data. And so we'll just talk to them. Opportunity, you know, and then the, the, the lack of transparency, like in the city, which has become so fearful in Ottawa right now, you can't release anything. You know, it might be different than the communications coming out of the Prime Minister's office. And we're saying, whoa, we'll just be like Seinfeld's program, where George wakes up and says, we're going to be the exact antithesis of myself and the previous day. We're going to be the opposite. So like, we're going to brag about people that I'm bald and I live with my parents, right? So that's what George said. So we're just going to, we're going to publish everything. We're going to have a website. You know what? And if we ask people for data, you know, we'll, we'll put it on our website. You know, and then we'll get, you know, Katie O'Malley to hammer these people when they don't give us the data. And so, like... This all becomes a model of the future because in the middle of difficulty, you'll find opportunity. Then the government says, you know, we're having a budget, we're having austerity. You know, it's not convenient for us to give you spending time. Whoa! <laughs> we'll take you to court. This is amazing. You know, just you know, five years was no, it's great five years. But then the last quote I really like: "There is no progress without change." George Bernard Shaw: "No progress without change." So some of those issues that we talked about, the power of the purse, you know, going back to evidence-based decision making, you know, getting our heads out of the sand and talking about the big, longer-term issues. You have to change things. We are not on a good trajectory right now. Not a lot. So we just have to recognize it. So you know, as citizens, as whether you're the PBO. Now I'm an unemployed citizen. Like you have to, it has to. If it matters, we have to make it matter for these people, and then we can bring about the change. Thank you very much. Thank you. some of my colleagues who are two floors up who work for Environment Canada, some of those very famous scientists we've been talking about who also are not allowed to share their information with others. Um, so if anyone has any questions, if you would like to, we'll start over here and then we'll move up. Yes? 
when I look at the uh, budget for the BC government, it comes, it, there's pages and pages, dozens of pages of estimates, right down to the departmental level in terms of last year and this year. For the federal government budget, I couldn't find that kind of information. Is that read the way it is? But a follow up, could the, the International Committee of Investigative Journalists tell me about <laughs> Did everyone hear the question at the back? Uh, the question was with respect to the amount of detail that was seen in the BC uh, budget that was recently released as opposed to the federal budget. And the second uh, follow up was could the International Society of if the Investigative Journalists, uh, the one that recently uh, got the Cook, Cook Island info, could they help you out? <laughs> Well, just like, I think just on the media, the media plays to me a fundamental role. You know, we, I was, we were widely, I was criticized for using the media. Some people said I used it just to make me protect the office. And, uh, but to me, I don't actually, like, for me, the media is not like dancing with the stars. Like for me, the media is like, it plays that fifth estate role. They're scrutinizing all of us. So if, you know, if Kevin Page, the priority budget officer, sounds, starts sounding like he's in his five-year reign as priority budget, sounding like a politician, they are right on top of this guy. They're keeping everybody honest. They're asking for stuff. I think the media saw with us over the past five years some symmetry. Like we're poking. Like, okay, you know, what, what do you have behind these estimates or that estimates? So they naturally kind of align themselves to us. And you know, I think so. Like, I think our media needs to be stronger in this in our country. And I, the, the, I think you know the House of Commons needs to be stronger. But I think the way to do that is to educate us all. And you know, would you know an international presence even help more? Perhaps it could. I think I think you know I think to some degree I think OECD, IMF, uh, world, well, mostly OECD and IMF, they they see a difference what's going on in the past few years, and it's they don't like the trends either. So this is starting to get recognized. Um, so the first question was. The yeah. Budget and Part of it is just in structure. So, like, we design our, our system in Ottawa. Like, we have these high-level like policy documents. Actually, it starts with the speech on the throne. It's usually, like, here's the big directions. Here's my key priorities. You know, it used to be like you know five-page document, a lot of poetry. Then the budgets is a policy document. But, you know, at the front end, it's like, here's where we think the planning framework is going to look like over the next five years. And then here's the new policy measures. Then the detailed documents are actually separate. Like, you know, they're what we call these blue books. And you get you know, the estimates documents, the reports and plans and priorities. So these documents do exist, except they're not consistent in Ottawa with the budget. So you can't actually go, okay, here's the budget fiscal framework, here's all the departments, you, here's the spending over the next few years, here's, it's not consistent, they're totally, they're misaligned. And you know, we got into this fist fight literally in the fall of 2011 when the government actually started saying, well, you know, we're going to have an austerity budget in 2012, we've got to get the books balanced over the median term, we're saying, fine, we're the priority budget office, we'll help you out. And they said, we're going to release all the details in these reports and plans and priorities, which are the detailed departmental spending reports. Then a few weeks later, I said, no, we're not getting, you're not getting any details. So even before the budget, we knew it. And we said, well, this is wrong. Like, we need to see the details. You've been working on this for over a year like, on, on how we're going to find the spending restraint, which is significant spending restraint. Again, because that, that spending was growing at more than 6% a year on average over the past 10 years. Now you're saying the next five years is going to stay flat. You've got to show us how you're going to do that. And, and then in, that turned into, like, at the PBO, like, three rounds of letters with deputies to show us the plans. Each one of them saying we're not getting anything, and then it turned out I had two rounds of letters with the with the clerk of the Privy Council office. We're not getting anything, and then we had you know cabinet ministers, ministers Baird, Minister Squarity, Minister commencing in the summer of 2012. You're exceeding your mandate, and then that's how we ended up in the federal court. And again, in the federal court, I'm not suing anybody. I'm just saying these guys are saying it's outside my mandate. I'm saying I'm reading the Act of Parliament says the estimates, the government, nations, the finances. Like that's my mandate. So that's how we ended up, you know, there. So there's there were what we call simulated transparency, which is you know almost the kind of kind of transparency that it, its purpose is to confuse you, for the most part. So if you can't go from a budget document over the next five years, here's the total spending plan for the government, major programs, to departmental spend, like you're just that those are documents that are meant to confuse people, and yet we put them in front of parliamentarians. That's all we give them, and we say, Mrs. May, you vote on it now. And you, you know, you sign off on the spending for D&D, for Food Inspection Agency, Agriculture Canada, you know, Fisheries and Oceans, et cetera, et cetera. You sign off on your authorities. And then that goes back to power of the purse. They're, you know, the, you know, if you're not part of the executive, your job is to hold the government to account. That's a very noble job. And you know, it can be done in a way that it, it elevates everybody. 
better, richer debate, more party scrutiny. It doesn't have to be nasty partisan politics. I can, you know, even the PBO, I can make that sexy. We had a, <laughs> we had a question about, we have two microphones on the side. Uh, I believe they work. And maybe we could take the question in the back while anyone else would like to ask a question, come to the microphone. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, just, uh, you, 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 but I also see a lot of deficit in our first community, our First Nations people, yeah. and also in the environmental deficit. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how we can include those deficits in our calculations of our financial development. Well, we're a long ways, I think, away from uh, from getting to the point where we look at and you know, we talk, talk about you know, how much value or income is generated in the economy that kind of looks at those deficits for various kind of communities or you know starts pricing in all these externalities that you know accumulate on the accumulate on the environmental side. We're not there. Like in my office. You know, we actually started up one of our first big projects in the summer, uh, spring of 2009, in the middle of a recession. We looked at Aboriginal educational infrastructure. And so, you know, and I thought I knew the deputy very well. He gave us what we thought was the data. We looked at so how much money are we setting aside? Like, what is the model we're using to set aside for Aboriginal people so that they have, you know, good you know, educational structures? So we built a, a capital budgeting model, which we stole from primary schools, secondary schools, social housing people. We actually came to BC and talked to social housing people. How do you do that? And then, so we costed that model out. We said, like, every year we're about 100 million short. Like, there's no, you know, when we looked at, again, it's not a complicated model. How old are these structures? What kind of shape are they in? How much money do you set aside to recapitalize? 100 million short. We spend about 120 million a year on average educational infrastructure. We should be spending 200 million a year for all these structures that are out there. So again, we didn't look at the big picture, but we just said, like, give us one thing we can bite on. And that's a problem. So like, really, just in that simple thing, you can see the deficit. So what kind of, you know, what kind of facilities are we have? And, and again, this is a federal responsibility. And on the environmental side, like I hope that you know, maybe my next future, you know, is, you know, in working in, in an academic, where I'm an academic institution, that we can kind of start to look at some of those issues. You know, there are people that work that's being done by Professor Stiglitz in different parts of the world that kind of change the, how we measure goods and services. And I think that will be, that is the future. We're, you know, I think that's not the short-term future, but it's probably more a medium and long-term future. And so there is, there's been a push, and it has some political impetus. It kind of died a little bit with the recession, but I don't think it's, it's not over. Question there? Uh, Mr. Page, I, I thought I understood the whole parliament worked fairly well, but obviously it missed something, and maybe you can help me with this. If the, the PBO's office was at the pleasure of the Prime Minister, why can't Parliament appoint the PBO at the pleasure of Parliament? Yes. That is the fix. I think that we need like, the legislation, you know, the person, like the next priority budget, if the legislation was fixed, and this is the bad hand up. I was hoping like I would be able to kind of make the case with, you know, with a lot of work that we need to, you know, to fix the legislation in the office. I didn't achieve that. Yeah, we have to fix the appointment procedure. This person should be appointed with by parliament, exactly as you said. This person should be, you know, should be dismissed at by cost. I work at pleasure. I can be dismissed any time during the five years. I could have just said, you know, enough. You know, no longer pleasurable. So why? Who would take this job? <laughs> like, who would take this job to be the parliamentary budget officer when you go home and you know, I'm sorry, honey, but I'm done. You know, so okay, what's the next step? Well, there is no next step. You know, and so. And the other thing, I think the issue of, um, and Mrs. May talked about it, you know, the, like, the office that we're, we, it, there's something like independence does not mean you're better than anybody. Independence means that you know, for the five years of, at the Parliament the Budget Officer, you hold me responsible, you hold me accountable. So every time we costed something, like you know, if the work was shoddy, hold me accountable. You know, if we were doing projections and we didn't do rich analysis around it, hold me accountable. But also, at the same time, I don't want to be interfered by the bureaucracy. I don't want to be interfered by the government. I don't want to be, to be interfered by, you know, by other members of parliament. I give this information, to, you know, to say in this context to Mrs. May. She doesn't have to use it. This is just dear data points that she could or decide to use it or not to use. She has to make her own judgment whether she likes it. But you hold me accountable. So the office needs to be independent. And right now, for me, honestly, in the back office, we fought for our website. You know, it took me two years to get an HR plan. We've had con contracts, even right up into the last weeks of my job, that they weren't signing off on. Which is, these are all tools that you can use to intimidate people. And I think our office, for the most part, we just said, no, we're, we're going to still do the work anyways. 
But so yeah, I think an independence of the office would help as well. Yes. Question there, and then we'll come over here. I'm just wondering, uh, can the provinces play a greater role in getting accountability from Ottawa, or do they already? Uh, well, it was, uh, I mean, a couple of points on that. I mean, when the, when the government decided to cut the Canada Health Transfer, and it was growing at a, at a 6% escalator, and it's just a you know, number that you know, at that time was like 33, 34 billion dollars a year, and it was growing at 6%. Then you say, for the, you know, starting in 2015, 16, it's going to go up 3% a year. Like there should have been at least a number to the, you know, provided in a budgetary document or when Minister Flaherty announced it to the provinces that this was going to be an impact. There was nothing. PBO, we did a report saying this is going to cost over 30 billion dollars by the time you get up to the 10-year period. This is fundamentally going to move that fiscal gap to the provinces because of aging demographics over the next two decades. So I think there's, like, the, the, there should have been pressure on the federal government to say, we're making a decision, and here's the reason why we're making it. Instead, I think for the, they walked away from the whole health care debate at a time when we were hitting this aging, aging demographic issue. But I would say on the crime bills and those issues, like we were quoting the provinces in 2009 saying, have you done your analysis? We phone all the problems that you know, like this, we're changing the criminal code. This is mostly you guys. And the feds are changing it, but you're gonna have to pick up the bill here. Have you done it? No, we didn't see anywhere. Like we were going right across the country. And there were times when we were doing our sustainability work, which is again, looking at the long term, and we said we wanted to do this for the provinces. We were phoning provincial finance departments and we don't want to play. I said, well, we're not, you can see the work, you can criticize our work, you can critique our work before we put it out. No, you know, we shouldn't be doing this work. So like, it's still like, when I go back to there's no, you know, there's, there's no progress without change. Like, there's still a lot of barriers to break down. And so again, with the provinces, we need to find better relationships. But in a federation, where you're transferring a whole bunch of money, you know, Canada Health Transfers, Canada Social Transfers, Equalization Programs, Criminal Codes, which are, you know, federal, you know, Feds are changing it, but the provinces are administrating. There should be this more information coming to the center and made available to the public, and it's not there. So I would say the provinces, have, you know, they've dropped the ball too. Got a question over here? I'd like to be comment on uh, support for the PBO among parliamentarians generally. So if the Conservative Party, you know, ministers wouldn't call you, they're civil servants from that party and so on. What about other parties? I imagine you talked to Elizabeth May, you said Paul Martin called you, but what about uh, other people? Was there support? Well, I think there was uh, early on in the first couple of years. You know, I, I it got to the point actually in this in the summer of 2009. I was wondering whether I re really had a job. I didn't think I had any clients, you know. And um, because we were going in front of committees and uh, the Joint Committee of the Library of Parliament, which was the House and Senate Committee, and you know they were saying, well, your all your work should be confidential. And I said, well, a legislative budget office can't do confidential work. You can't cost the war fighter planes give it to a member under the table and say, this is your number now, walk away from it. Like, you, you, that's not the way we do it. They, they actually, that was a recommendation. And then it was signed off by this you know, joint committee. It was actually endorsed by the Senate. I went home that night and I said, I told my wife, I'm quitting. I said, but you can't quit. I said, well, I got no clients. And, uh, but it, it, the office said, no, we're not quitting. Well, just Kevin, do what you always do. Just don't pay attention. <laughs> So we basically I drafted an action plan and you know on these ten recommendations and one of the recommendations on that confidentiality issue was I will do nothing confidential and here's why I won't do it. So the member will say I want a confidential document, I'll say, okay, I'm not gonna do it, but I'll tell you right at the beginning before we even start the project. Because you know, you have to agree that if we're gonna spend six months or even longer, like I mean some of these projects take a long time, costing fighter planes or ships, we have a small office, a few people will work on this. We get independent, you know, uh, uh, to people to peer review this stuff. I have to release it. Like you have to know what I'm doing, and then you have to hold me accountable. If it's lousy work, I should be turned, dismissed by cause. There's nothing wrong with that. I get that, and um, but that's not the system that we have now. We have uh, two final questions, and then uh, we've got some words to uh, an announcement to make uh, towards the end. Um, over here, a question from one of our uh, live web stream viewers was. Uh, do you think the current federal government will institute any kind of bail-ins as is happening in Europe, or maybe happening? Yeah, I don't, again, that's another area of the, uh, the budget that it was, you know, it seemed uh, like there it wasn't, it wasn't, there was no substance there. We don't really know where that's going. I think it's dangerous to use the, you know, words that, as I said, 
oh, the bail-in. A bail-in is a kind of a concept that's been used a lot, particularly in Europe, where there's been a lot of stress trying to you know, create a stronger banking monetary union. And you know, some, there's some healthier economies, like Germany and some of the Netherlands economies are saying, like, why are we using our money to bail out Cyprus? Why are we using our money to bail out Ireland? Why are we using our money to bail out this, you know, Spanish banks? They should be bailing out themselves. They should be taking care of us. People, you know, that you know, asset holders should be, you know, should be, should, you know, they should be a kind of a buyer beware sort of thing. Uh, you know, so I think that I was surprised that they used the word bail in. I'm not really sure how that's going to be implemented. I think again, it's a few paragraphs that basically talks about the world is changing. Canada didn't have a financial crisis. Meanwhile, there's a lot of discussion going on across banking. And how do we kind of prevent? You know uh, these big banks from failing in the future, and taking you know, and taxpayers paying, you know, paying the big cost. How do we hold people more accountable within the banking industry? So I don't know where that's going to go. I mean, I think you know, normally, as I said, I think over over supper time, previous budgets, uh, you know, under different administrations, perhaps different deputy ministers, you would have seen a, like a white paper or like a separate budgetary document. And it would have been like a consultation document saying, okay, this is what, how the world is changing. These bigger banks are at play. Here's how your deposit insurance system works. You know, here's just some of the options that we're going to look at. And we'll be consulting over the next year or two years before we make changes. But there was, I, I don't understand where that is going. But that's not the only part of the budget that seems to be more spin than substance. Question over here, and then we'll give Elizabeth the final question. But, but not yet. We have a question over here, Elizabeth. You have to wait your turn. Okay, uh, my question. Um, is uh, I don't want to think that I'm completely naive, um, but I want to believe so, so much in this system. I want to believe in it. I try, with so many people, I try to, especially younger people, um, I'm 33, but I still try to convince people even younger than me to participate in some way, and um, that's what it is. I, I hope that we can trust each other in government. Uh, the confidentiality thing, that's always been, it seems to be an issue and becomes more and more of an issue. Um, and I just, I wish that, yeah, I wish that, I, I wish that I can believe in it. I, I do believe in it, but I just, I really, really, I want it to happen so badly, so, so badly. And um, I hope that because we can trust each other, things like having that transparent system will help me believe so wholeheartedly in that system. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. That was so beautiful. I believe in it too, and I think it can actually fix it. I have a question because I've been worried about this, and I got this question on my BlackBerry right before getting here from a reporter in Ottawa, and I promised I'd call her tomorrow and tell her what I think, so I'm going to ask you. Uh, the question is um, Sonia Lur, the uh, librarian of Parliament, who's now serving as Parliament's budget officer. By the way, the ad for new PBO is on. Like business pages, the Globe and Mail, you can read the ad break. They're looking for someone who has good conciliation skills. <laughs> somebody, somebody who isn't a watchdog, more of a lapdog, someone very pleasant, very nice, somebody who obviously doesn't have your personality problems. <laughs> you, obviously, you obviously alienated people by wanting information and doing your job instead of a nice, friendly little PBO person you should have been. So anyway, um, I'm very distressed about future PBO. So my second part of my question is, first part of the question is, what's going to happen to the federal court case? When do you think the answers will come down? And do you think there's a risk of uh, the current acting PBO pulling the application because it's in the name of the office, not you personally? And then before I leave the mic, I just got to say, if I get to be prime minister, you're my minister of finance, man. I'm not taking anybody else. That's it. Yes. Well, I would just to go back to the, the, the question for the gentleman, I, I believe in the system. Like I don't think there's anything I think the Westminster system, the principles, uh, you know, the, the you know, the having the executive sit within parliament, having, you know, the, the rest of the legislature hold the executive to account, that's a perfectly good system. The Prime Minister working with confidence of the House of Commons, a perfectly good system. Like we can work with that system. We don't need to change the principles, we don't need to throw them out. We can work with it and I think it evolves very nicely. Um, so I, I'm like that, but I believe in it. You should believe it. Should we trust the better angels of our nature to quote Mr. Lincoln now? You know, so on issues of transparency, those who should just be, that's a principle. Like in the 21st century world, this is taxpayers' money. I want to know how it's, it's going to be spent. And I don't think, you know, Mrs. May pu pu publishes everything she spends. 
you know, on you know, on our website like that. You know, we wouldn't have any of those debates we had in the Senate if everybody was doing that. Because and maybe we didn't even need an accountability act. Maybe we just needed a transparency act. Because um, a lot of us would have went away. Now, in terms of the federal court case, I think we're going to win. Uh, I really do. I think that uh, again, I'm the I'm the applicant, Mr. Mulcair, the leader of the official opposition, is the respondent. You know, I, he asked me to do more work looking at you know, the spending restraint. I couldn't do it because I was deemed to be exceeding the mandate by the executive. So we have a very strong case. The Attorney General is trying to say, you know, at, at, at federal court, as were the speakers, that you know the federal court has no role in you know, overseeing you know, this act of parliament. And I'm saying this is the law of the land, the act of parliament. I didn't write it, you wrote it. And it is the role of the federal court to kind of to see whether that act is being followed or not. So and I think we, you know, it, it may be months before we get a decision. Uh, and it's possible there will be an appeal process. And so we would, you know, we'll go to the federal court of appeals. It's possible if we win there, we could even go to the Supreme Court. And it's just, but again, I still think that's, that's how the, you change the system. Again, there's no progress without change. You have to stand up. Like, it would have been really easy to say, no, we're not going to bother. Federal court, that sounds really complicated. You know, I might not get my ambassadorship job, which I obviously didn't get. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but you do it. That's how change happens, right? People just say, no, I just, we need, there is, there is a better way. And I think um, in terms of where are the, you know, is there a risk that it'll get thrown out? Oh, wait, there's always a risk. Yeah, there is a risk. And as the librarian reports to the speakers of the House and the Senate, I mean, which creates this kind of conflict of interest kind of issue. And the speakers are literally, you know, in federal court saying that this, this, the federal court should not be you know, taking away, quote unquote, a parliamentary privilege but, you know, by deciding on whether or not, you know, uh, the PBO is within or was not within mandate. And I think, again, to me, the power, isn't the power of the first time, like, even something like, bigger than a parliamentary privilege? Like, that's why we send elected representatives who are not part of the executive. Like that's to me that you know that's the principle that we should stay focused on. So, but I think we're going to win, and uh, I think the government thinks is worried that we're going to win too. So, it, but it will go on for months, and that is just. But that's the way the system works. That's okay. I don't have no problems with that. So it's a fight worth fighting. Thank you. Thank you.